Hassan. Hi, good evening, Arun. How are you? Good evening. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Is it dinner, dinner time at your place? Um, kind of over. <laughs> dinner is over. It's 9.30 now. Okay. I, I believe you guys would have either reached home or you would be heading to private practices soon. No, no, we've reached home. Okay, okay, okay. Most okay. of us don't do private practice at this time. Okay, okay, okay. That's good. That's a relief. That's nice to know that you've got some good time for family. So, uh, good evening, Dr. Arun. Good evening, uh, Dr. Asim. Hi, hi, good evening. Good evening Is Dr. there anybody else or we'll start? Uh, I, I will start right now. <clears throat> Good evening, uh, Dr. Sushil Jaleer. I'm sorry yeah, for the technical evening. glitch, which took some time for us to join. And unfortunately, I'm not well today, so probably you'll have to take care of the session because I just came back and I'm in a bad shape with maxillary sinusitis. Oh. So, uh, I'll be there, but uh, probably you'll have to take care of the whole meeting. Sure, sure. Fine with us. So, uh, uh, would you like to check? Uh, check first speaker is Dr. Asim. Would you like to check your uh, uh, slide share part? Sure, oh, no problems at all. Does that look good? Yes. All yes. Right. That, so those are your slides, right? Yeah. So most of them will be white background. The first couple of one are a bit colorful. Uh, the okay, rest are fine. standard. So perfectly fine. We are good to start now. So good evening, dear friends. Uh, my name is Richard Chaturvedi. I work as senior consultant in the Department of Endocrinology and Metabolism at Apollo Hospital, New Delhi. And I welcome you all to this session on bariatric surgery. Obesity prevalence has risen steadily and dramatically uh, for several decades and its complications and comorbidities, they place a huge burden on uh, patient and the society. Attempts to treat obesity through surgical procedures, they were first attempted more than 60 years ago Earlier techniques like jejunoileal bypass, they were associated with uh, 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 significant complications and so were abandoned. Uh, modern techniques, they offer improved outcomes and minimal complication rates. Although earlier, some considered bariatric surgery as a draconian approach to obesity, weight loss with modern bariatric surgery is substantial and sustained and associated with remission or improvement of type 2 diabetes mellitus and associated comorbidities like dyslipidemia, hypertension. And given the magnitude and rapidity of improvement of hyperglycemia and glucose homeostasis, these procedures have been suggested as treatment for type 2 diabetes, even in the absence of severe obesity. So today in this session, we are going to talk about bariatric surgery, and we have two eminent speakers to elaborate on various aspects of bariatric surgery. So uh, before we move on, I request our participants to post their questions in the chat box. Which will be and those questions will be answered after the completion of talk by the by the speaker. So our first speaker is Dr. Asim Shabir, who will be speaking on current indications for bariatric surgery and metabolic surgery. Dr. Asim Shabir is head of uh, the Department of Surgery at National University of Singapore and National University Hospital Singapore. He is also the chief of general surgical services at Alexandra Hospital. He is a founding member and past president of Obesity Metabolic Surgery Society of. Uh, Singapore. He has special interest in upper GI surgery, bariatric and metabolic surgery, advanced endoscopy, and laparoscopic surgery. Dr. Asim has published 10 research papers in reputed journals. So over to you, Dr. Asim Shabir. Thank you very much, Dr. Chaturvedi, for that kind introduction, and thank you for inviting me uh, to speak uh, on the topic. Um, I, I really admire your passion uh, to educate people mm -hmm. and uh, great work uh, that you guys are doing. Um, so I, I basically, as Dr. Govedi said, uh, belong to the National University of Singapore and the National University Hospital, mm -hmm. and I currently teach and do research uh, in the same institutions. So the topic that is given to me is current indications for bariatric and metabolic surgery. So um, the, the very first origin of bariatric metabolic surgery saw BMI as the criteria because uh, the authors of those times actually used the available data, which was only BMI, to basically classify obesity, and then they subsequently used it to publish guidelines. If you generally see WHO's definitions are also based on BMIs with class two and class three obesity coming under the realm of surgical intervention and having differential of about 2.5 BMI for the Asian BMI category. 
the NIH, I'll give you a little bit of historic perspective before I go into the current guidelines. The NIH guidelines basically had three meetings. NIH, the Institute, National Institute of Health, basically did not publish these guidelines themselves. They actually hosted consensus conferences. Uh, there were four of these that were hosted in 1978, 85, 91. The 91 NIH guidelines are the one that were most commonly used. However, these were revised in 1998. <clears throat> Again, uh, the NIH actually in 2007 commissioned another expert panel to revise these guidelines, including one surgeon. Uh, uh, however, the members of this were basically the AHA, uh, the ACC, and the TOS group. And they actually did not publish guidelines, but they came up with what was an expert panel five years down the road, which was 2013. What they came up was basically that they should have gone through uh, pharmacological and medical therapy before they could go on to the surgical things. Uh, at that time, restrictive procedures or bypass procedures were common, and they should be considered for well and motivated patients. Uh, and those who were basically candidate of surgery at that time were encouraged to be part of MDT, uh, multidisciplinary teams and operations were to be performed in experienced institutions by experienced sur surgeons and lifelong surveillance was mandated. They recommended a BMI of 40 without comorbidities and 35 to 40 with high risk comorbidities where you generally can see are largely metabolic comorbidities. <laughs> And then these guidelines uh, were then accepted and the BMI was raised for the, uh, the second cohort with comorbidities to 35. Um, at that time, the concept of below 35 and there was no data, so below 35 was not considered. At the same time, about a decade later, the Asian BMI criteria came out where they were using 35 kilograms per meter square for those without comorbidities, 32.5 with comorbidities, and 30 for those who basically uh, with other significant comorbidities. And this was an purely an Asian consensus that was not accepted by many other institutions. This was published by Mustafa Mufazil Akdawala from Bombay itself. So we've gone through different eras in the history of uh, appraising the guidelines and the era of bariatric surgery basically saw where the goal was to induce weight loss and treat severe obesity. Then subsequently <clears throat> followed the era of bariatric surgery and diabetic surgery, where the GI surgery's primary intent was to treat type two diabetes, whether to set it to remission or to engage in improvement. And this was basically to treat hyperglycemia to prevent ill health in the long term. And subsequent to this, uh, one of the big revolutions came when um, Francesco Rubino, uh, David Cummings, and uh, the likes of Kaplan, Paul uh, Zimet, and Phil Schauer, and many others from medical fraternity took part and published this in Diabetic Care in 2016. And they published the algorithm. What is great about this algorithm, uh, sorry. What is great about this algorithm of uh, that was published by these people was the fact that this algorithm basically took into account now a disease-based selection criteria. Moreover, they lowered the BMI criteria for Caucasians and in Asians even brought it down to lower low BMIs of 27.5. So this was the first attempt to not only lower BMI, but also target surgery based on disease profiles of patients. <clears throat> now, then came the era of what we call metabolic and bariatric surgery. So here, not only was weight important, not only was metabolic disease profile important, but also mechanical complications of obesity started playing a huge role. So things like joint pains, things like sleep apnea and others were now started to increasingly be uh, uh, included. Things like infertility also became part of the entire uh, indications for surgery. If you look at the current stating guidelines, generally North America, South America, and Europe follow either 
the NIH, which has just recently become redundant. As I told you that the last review of NIH consensus guidelines was in 1998. The ASMBS and ISO together came up with a new guideline, which is basically now prevalently used in North America, South America, Europe, and the Australian continent. The African continent as such does not have. The Asian con continent has few, including the Aussie, which I will discuss in a moment. This is, the up, uh, this is the updated version of the ASMBS and ISO guidelines just released a month ago. The major updates from the NIH 1991 is that now metabolic bariatric surgery in the Caucasian group is also recommended at 35 kilograms per meter square in the presence, absence, or severity of comorbidity. So what used to be 40 BMI is now 35 BMI. In individuals with metabolic disease, what used to be 35 BMI is now 30 to 35 point, is 35 kilograms per meter square. For Asians, the threshold uh, that BMI 25 is considered obesity, clinical obesity, and individuals beyond 27.5 kilograms per meter square should be considered and offered metabolic bariatric surgery. So these are the key highlights of these new guidelines. This guidelines also focuses on extremes of age. It tells you that people over the 60, the people over the age of 70 are no longer considered contraindicated for surgery. Uh, and they basically did put up a caution that careful selection that includes assessment of frailty is, recommend, is recommended. So you don't go and operate on patients who basically are very frail and will perish from the, from the surgery rather than from any other comorbidities. They spoke about adolescent bariatric surgery and they agreed with the recommendations made by the American Academic of Pediatrics and ASMBS recommendations, which include BMI about 120% of the 90th percentile with comorbidities as an indication for surgery, and those with above 140% of the 95th percentile, which is class three adolescent obesity without a comorbidity as an indication for surgery. What is great is in these guidelines, they have put down that the tenor stage and Voge aid should not be considered a requirement for surgery because they have shown that these children do actually develop normally. Moreover, syndromic obesity, which used to be a contraindication and was thought to result in development delay, autistic spectrum and history of trauma is no longer in adolescent considered a contraindication for surgery. And these guidelines were then taken over by, taken up by the American Diabetic Association and they recommended more or less the same recommendations for indications for surgery. But what I liked about the ADA recommendation versus the other group recommendation of ISO and ASMBS, they have been clear in what is recommended and what is considered. So what ASMBS says is recommended 30 to 34.9 BMI, here they said, okay, you should consider it if they cannot achieve durable weight loss or improvement in uh, comorbidities. The second thing I like about the ADA guidelines is it tells you where surgery should be performed in high uh, volume centers. Uh, it should be, patients should be evaluated for psychological issues and social and situational issues before interfering with surgery. We know a lot of failures coming from these issues. And then we should be able to provide long-term medical and behavioral and routine monitoring of micronutrients, nutritional and metabolic surgery. So they go one step ahead in defining the standards of care as well here. <clears throat> and they said that the uh, evaluation of mental health is an ongoing process. They talk about post-bariatric hypoglycemia and how to manage it as well. So a slight one step ahead of the ASMBS if so guidelines. If, if I draw your attention to <clears throat> Asia, I'll first talk about China. And China recently put up in 2022 its own guidelines. Here again, you see that they have split simple obesity, i.e. bariatric surgery into metabolic surgery. What I like is they have put up criteria by BMI as well. People uh, of the international criteria actually go straight on to surgery. But those who do not meet but have central obesity and have failed medical therapy then can move on to surgery. And what I like about them is they have actually given how frequently the patient should be followed up, at least in the first year of their guidelines. 
The second guidelines, which I have the honor to have reviewed, are basically the Obesity Metabolic Surgery Society of India, the OSCE guidelines. Some of you here in the audience are authors on this paper that was uh, published in 2000, uh, and uh, which is about to be published uh, in 2020. And this is basically by uh, one of them is Arun Prasad. And you see the OSCE guidelines here clearly indicate 35, um, 35 BMI with or without comorbidities, more or less parallel to the if so the ASMBS guidelines, the if so guidelines, and the ADHA <clears throat> just adjusted for BMI for Asians and thirty with two comorbidities and and go a step ahead and say twenty seven point five and above till about thirty BMI for those with uncontrolled type two diabetes. Um, I like and I appreciate the last statement, which is that below 27.5, it is totally experimental and should be done through proper uh, ethical approval and informed consent, and it's not standard of care. They touched upon age uh, in the OSCE guidelines and 18 and above are, for, are free to go through. Those under 18 still can be recommended, provided they are discussed at a multidisciplinary team. And those above 65 are also recommended provided they are medically fit and the, ben the benefit of surgery outweighs the risk of surgery. So a great initiative by the OSCE guidelines. They also define uh, weight based on uh, body circumference and use the upper limits of what are recommended. Uh, 80 centimeters in female for weights and 90 centimeters for males. Uh, they do, <coughs> the guidelines speak about uh, long-term weight management program and those patients only committed to such programs should be inducted in surgery. And they also talked about long-term follow-up, which is great because now people are increasingly seeing failure of problems uh, coming from weight regain, nutritional complications. And I like uh, the stance that has changed from contraindications in bariatric surgery and OSI has come up to put down not advised as a treatment option to those patients uh, who have uh, who do not wish to be followed up for long, who are medically unfit, who have unstable psychiatric disorders. If they are stable on medical uh, drugs, uh, they can still have surgery. Those who are chronic alcoholics or smoker uh, is a relative contraindication for surgery. Uh, those with short life expectancy having terminal Ill illnesses are not good candidates and pregnant women should basically not be allowed to have surgery should they wish to get pregnant within the 12 months of surgery because they're undergoing weight loss and there is competition between different physiologies. The Koreans have a similar guidelines as uh, the Aussie guidelines. Their insurance has started to pay in 2019. Uh, the Japanese consensus basically pretty much similar to the Korean and the Aussie guidelines and uh, blending with the Chinese guideline. Uh, but what is interesting is uh, because of the specific nature of disease profile uh, here in the uh, Japanese cohort, you sleeve D see sleeve DJB paid by the insurance because of presence of large uh, risk of gastric cancer uh, in their society, and it has been recommended as a standard mainline procedure. The Aussie guidelines also looked at SLEED, bypass, OAA, GV, uh, BPDS uh, as standard procedures, whereas other procedures uh, like um, uh, the, in, the small bowel interposition have also been included in the Aussie guidelines. <clears throat> so it gave me a moment to think, when we have everything, why aren't we getting our acts together uh, in these guidelines? I think um, there's a lot that needs to be done because it's quite a complex matrix when we guide patients. Patients have their own expectations, their own goals. <clears throat> We never take those into account and equate into the options that we give the patient to either go through surgery or the procedures or what level of uh, expectations they would have. We still struggle to say which procedure matches which patients. How do we match this? How do we bring this in our selection criteria and recommendations for indications? We know certain procedures are good, but again, how do you put this into the whole <clears throat> matrix of calculating selection criteria. We never talk about quality of life and weight loss in these patients. Can somebody have weight loss because the patient is surgery, because the patient is having low esteem? Is that an indication for surgery? We don't talk about it. How do we bring it into the matrix of selection criteria? 
We do not talk about excess of care, although we have great tools, great surgeons, but how many people can pay for these services? How many people have access to these services? How many people have access to long-term care? How do we put it into the equation for different countries for selection of bariatric surgery? <clears throat> how do we use great scoring systems like the Diron score, like the ABCD score? How do we redefine and term obesity so we can match for selection and criteria? We have calculators that tell you what's the risk of remission of diabetes, what is the risk of relapse of diabetes once remission is achieved. How do you use this? How do you build this information to select patients, to match patients, not only for the procedures, but for the outcomes? <clears throat> we, we do not take into account complex diseases like reflux. How do we recommend procedures, which is the best outcomes? We do not have great data to do these as yet. Um, one of the big black holes in the field of bariatric surgery is, are there any indications for regional procedures? Is weight gain, all weight gain, an uh, indication for regional procedures? Is uh, nutritional deficiency uh, indication? How do we bring this into the metrics of selection? To me, the future is going to be multi-pronged. Ultimately, we will have answers to these questions. This, this data, along with the phenotypic data coming from the proteomics, metabolomics, genomics, and transcriptomics, will blend into a digital AI system, which will then help us make decisions better. Till then, we will use the current prevailing guidelines. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention, uh, and I will end my presentation here. Thank you, Dr. Shabi, for an uh, insightful uh, talk, very informative. Our next speaker is Dr. Arun Prasad, who will be speaking on uh, current endoscopic and surgical options for morbid obesity and diabetes. Dr. Arun Prasad is clinical lead and senior consultant in GI, bariatric and robotic surgery at Apollo Hospitals, New Delhi. He has 36 years of surgical experience. He has an experience of performing over 10,000 laparoscopic surgeries that include over 6,000 laparoscopic cholecystectomies, over 2,000 laparoscopic hernia surgery, 2,000 thoracoscopies, 1,500 bariatric surgeries and 500 robotic surgeries. Dr. Arun has the privilege of doing numerous world's first laparoscopic therapy Endoscopic robotic operations. He is former president of Obesity Surgery Society of India and president of International MGB OAGB Club for Bariatric Surgery. He is uh, the editor of Journal of Minimal Access Surgery, World Journal of Gastroenterology, as well as uh, review, reviewer of surgical endoscopy and obesity surgery and board member of EC Journal of Gastroenterology. He is currently the vice president of ARIS. He has published more than 55 peers, papers in various journals. And he was president of Obesity Surgery Society of India between 2018 to 2020. He is a president of International NGB OAGB Bariatric Club. So over to you, Dr. Arun Prasad. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for those kind words. So I will just start sharing my screen. And my friend Asim has done a wonderful job in giving us all a very good introduction and overview. I'll just get this right. Okay. Is my screen visible? Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. Right. So when we talk about metabolic and bariatric surgery, what are the options do we have today? So obesity treatment basically risk of living with obesity versus risk of surgery. That is what we need to compare. And the options are diet, pills, exercise, endoscopy, and surgery. <clears throat> and my talk today will concentrate on the last two options here. The first three we have covered in a previous uh, GAPIO meeting earlier. So first question that comes to the mind is how safe is metabolic diabetes surgery and there are many publications which are there on this matter and of this what we need to see is that the 30-day post-operative morbidity and mortality rates after laparoscopic bypass and other surgeries and here what we have done is in this study they have compared the complication rate, readmission rate, reoperation mortality between these various surgeries. 
the 30 day complication rate for gastric bypass was 3.4% which is about the same as laparoscopic gallbladder surgery and hysterectomy the hospital stays and readmission rates were similar to laparoscopic appendicectomy and the month long death rate for metabolic or diabetes surgery was about 0.3% which is the same as total knee replacement and about one tenth the risk of death after cardiovascular surgery so that is one myth that has been uh, busted. What are the weight loss procedures that we have today? We have endoscopic procedures like balloon, endoscopic sleeve, complications and redo. So these are the areas where endoscopy is used. Surgery is by the way of laparoscopic surgery, robotic surgery and also revision surgery. Now, endoscopy is advised in patients who are not obese enough to qualify for bariatric surgery, patients who are not fit for bariatric surgery, patients who do not want bariatric surgery. So we have these two procedures which are there. The left, you can see what is known as a gastric balloon. Here, what is done is by endoscopy, we put in a balloon into the stomach and that gives a feeling of fulfillment to the patient. And it has to be removed after a year. Some dissolvable balloons dissolve on their own. After the balloon has gone, we expect the patient to maintain the lifestyle and the eating habits which they had during the balloon period. The next is endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, also known as ESG. Here what we do is we staple the stomach from inside endoscopically to reduce the size of the stomach, as you can see there. So it's something like a sewing machine, whereby we are reducing the size of the stomach. This is what it looks like on endoscopy. You go inside, take a clip. Bariatric and metabolic surgery, here we manipulate normal organ systems. So the people who we do the bariatric surgery, they have a normal stomach, they have a normal intestine, and we manipulate this to achieve an alteration in physiology resulting in resolution of disease process and weight loss. So bariatric and metabolic surgery is not what is traditionally thought of that you, know, you reduce the amount of food intake. It's actually an alteration in the physiology. And how does that take place? I will explain in a few slides. So we have malabsorption, we have calorie restriction, we have increase in the energy expenditure, changes in eating behavior. What you see here is a clip which shows how this is done. This is the stomach and one of the procedures which we have is a sleeve gastrectomy whereby you can see how the stomach size is going to be reduced by stapling that part of the stomach away. And this also reduces some of the chemicals which are produced from the fundus of the stomach, also known as ghrelin, and that increases satiety, reduces the food intake. Also, the food is now going to pass rapidly down to the small intestine, and that has a physiological effect which I will be speaking about in subsequent slides. The second surgery which we do is what is known as the gastric bypass. In this, we cut a small pouch of the stomach. The remaining stomach is left as it is. Small intestine is resected there and taken up and joined there. And the bottom again, the small intestine is rejoined to maintain the continuity as you can see there. Now, in this case, what happens, the food, the blue comes from there and the bag and pancreatic fluids come from the other side and they meet up at the bottom. This is what a sleeve gastrectomy surgery looks like. And what you see there is the liver there, which is being lifted up. That's the stomach which has been picked up. We are detaching the 
greater momentum from the stomach. This leads to separation of the stomach from the greater momentum. Then we put in a bougie and fire certain staplers. So you can see with the staplers, the stomach is being cut and stapled at the same time. This is quite a bloodless surgery as you can see there. Eventually that part of the stomach will be dissected and removed. The most crucial part you can see right now, which is being removed, is the fundus of the stomach. Check the staple line. No bleeding, no leaks. And we are going to now remove the excised stomach through one of the holes which we had made for the surgery. That's the end of the surgery. So how does the sleeve gastrectomy work? Initially, it was thought to be a simple restrictive procedure. Small stomach, less calorie intake. Pylorus acts as a natural band effect. Now we also think that it also shows accelerated gastric emptying and absence of fundus means distension of antrum early leading to satiety and less hunger. There are enterohormones which are there. There are various hormones of which GLP-1 has been the one which has been discussed maximum. This is an incretin whereby GLP-1 is created in the ingestion of food and what it does is it increases the beta cell response and reduces the beta cell workload. So our manipulation of the physiology leads to an increase in the GLP-1 of the body. This is natural GLP-1 produced by the patient. So a minute here on uh, comparison between the two uh, mechanisms which we can see here. In the left, you see the plasma venous glucose and on the right, you see the C-peptide levels. So what exactly does this slide show? The green line is of oral glucose and the red line is of IV glucose. So when we give oral glucose to someone, on the left, as you can see, the plasma level goes up and comes down. If you give IV glucose, again, the plasma level is going to go up and come down. On the right, you see C-peptide levels, which represents the insulin in the body. And there you can see that oral glucose leads to an increase in the insulin, whereas IV glucose does not lead to a similar increase. This means when the glucose is entering the body through the intestine, there is what is known as an incretin effect. So this is the mechanism which is used for our surgeries. Now these are control patients. You can see the, this, the gap. And on the right, you see type 2 diabetes patients. Hence, an increase in the incretin effect in these patients of type 2 diabetes will also help them to resolve their diabetes. So the foregut theory talks about how when we food passes through the duodenum, and without passing through the duodenum. So the anti-incretins which are produced in the duodenal area is not produced. This was shown by a study where they put in some stents in the duodenum and that led to the animal losing weight and get, diabetes getting resolved. Then they did an endoscopy and made holes in the stent and the weight loss came back, so did the diabetes. The other theory is of the hindgut theory where rapid delivery of undigested food to the distal bowel leads to production of GLP-1 and similar chemicals. So this is what is the mechanism of gastric bypass surgery where there is a duodenal bypass, change in bile acids, early transit of food to the ileum, 
malabsorption, gut microflora alteration, which happens because of that. And that is what leads to weight loss and resolution of metabolic issues. There are two types of bypasses which we have, a Roux-en-Y bypass, where there are two limbs, an elementary and a biliopancreatic limb. It has a restrictive and malabsorptive combined action. These surgeries preferred with patients with GERD and diabetes. There is a second surgery, which is a mini gastric bypass of a single limb. It has a longer biliopancreatic limb, hence preferred in super obese and diabetics because there is more weight loss depending upon the bypass of the limb lengths. This is a small clip that shows us how a robotic bypass surgery is being done, <clears throat> where the surgeon is sitting at the robotic console and the suturing of the stomach pouch, which you saw in the animation earlier, to the small bowel. As it's a very specialized surgical slide. I will skip the video once you get the general idea of how this surgery is being done. This is an anastomosis which we have made between the stomach pouch and the stomach. A methylene blue leak test was done to check there is no leakage. So we have options of laparoscopic, bariatrics, or robotics. Laparoscopic is what is more widely available. It's cheaper, established worldwide, but it has some problems that the instruments are non-articulating and it's an assistant-dependent surgery. Robotic gives us a true 3D vision with articulating instruments and a control of all the ports. It's best to do, done in super obese and revision surgeries. However, it is more expensive than laparoscopic bariatric surgery and equipment is more bulky. This is a clip of how we are doing a robotic bariatric surgery in a patient who is about 275 kg. That's the robot which is being wheeled. This is known as docking of the robot where the robotic arms are connected to the abdominal trochas. I sit at the console there and control the instruments to do the surgery. This one is a mini gastric bypass, which I had mentioned earlier, we'd prefer in the super obese. Patient is in the recovery, shifted to the room an hour later, and in the evening, he's able to walk to the toilet. The same patient, he has now lost weight, but he's maintained his old genes. He's standing in the same genes and sent us this picture. And after a year, after losing more weight, he had to buy a new pair of genes. So this is the change which has taken place with our robotic metabolic surgery, a single stage surgery, which was done in this super obese patient. Developing bariatric surgery requires reading attending conferences, live workshops, observership, mentored surgery, and finally, independent surgery. So it, the surgeons have to go through a phase of training before they become bariatric surgeons. Finally, CMEs like this to help you stay updated. So which procedure is done? And in a nutshell, I would say BMI less than 32, we do gastric balloon and ESG. 32 to 40, we prefer a sleeve gastrectomy. 
Ruin by gastric bypass and in super obese, mini gastric bypass. If patient has metabolic issues like diabetes, we prefer bypass surgery. In GERD, a Ruin by gastric bypass is preferred. System failures, whereby I mean that you know patient has liver issues, kidney issues, then we prefer a sleeve gastrectomy because we don't want malabsorption taking place for the various drugs that they are taking. Sleeve complications when they occur, we usually go for a Ruin by gastric bypass. And for revision surgeries, we prefer a mini gastric bypass. So looking at it in a graphical form, as the BMI increases, we go from endoscopy to sleeve to Ruin Y gastric bypass to a mini gastric bypass. So to summarize, the prevalence of obesity and obesity related disorders is on the rise in adults, adolescents and pediatric population. Hence, this problem is unlikely to be resolved in the near future. In a perfect world, primary prevention through diet and exercise would elevate the need for surgery. Till we begin to see success with primary prevention or develop equally effective medical management, bariatric surgery will remain an important and reasonably safe tool in our armamentarium for treatment of obesity. With that, I end my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Over to the chairperson, Dr. Richa. Thank you, Dr. Arun, for a very uh, informative talk. And that was a dramatic change you showed in, in, in a patient, actually life-changing uh, uh, you know, phenomenon for a person over weighing over uh, you know, more than 200 kgs. So let's look at the questions at the chat box. I think we have one question. And uh, uh, the question is, uh, in addition to BMI for, it's for uh, Dr. Asim, I guess, in addition to BMI for age, are there... Uh, other independent indicators for eligibility of obese children with or without uh, any FLT to undergo bariatric surgery. Can a child less than 12 years of age undergo bariatric surgery? Um, so the guidelines do not really, um, the current guidelines do not spell this out. But if you look at the Australian guidelines, the New Zealand guidelines, which are probably the best of what the pediatric world has, most people would say 12 years and above. Uh, under 12, if they are super, super obese, if they have syndromic obesity, uh, the guidelines do make leeway for doing operations on this. Uh, but again, the compulsion that they have put is that they should be discussed in a pediatric multiple multidisciplinary board to discuss this. Uh, and, uh, and that's why uh, these are cautious guidelines and to protect the interest of the children. And uh, I think in those decision makings, the entire family has to be part of it. And it's much more complex as compared to the adult guidelines. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Asim. So uh, let me ask you a question, Dr. Arun. So uh, what are the uh, common procedures you are doing? I mean, which is the common? You would say sleeve gastrectomy is done more commonly or or uh, the bypass surgery is more common in our kind of patient setup. And are these surgeries covered by insurance? I don't think so, but is there any, any, any category of patients which can be covered by insurance? Yeah, sure. So uh, what the current situation is that we do in India, mainly sleeve gastrectomy is the commonest surgery. And in more tertiary centers like our centers, I actually end up doing more bypass surgeries because we get patients of much higher BMI and much more complicated who are not able to get their surgery done at smaller centers. So it's a little schooled. I do more bariatric uh, surgery in the super obese, a lot of robotic surgery, because those are the patients who come to our hospital as they have not been able to get surgeries done at smaller center. When it comes to insurance, yes, this is covered by insurance. I will share a slide uh, from my presentation, which will talk about the insurance. Mm, sorry. And the admin, yeah. So uh, this slide, I had hidden it because I thought Asim might have covered it, but yes, of course, he couldn't cover the Indian indication. Yeah. So these are the IRDA guidelines, which clearly state that since October 2020, Obesity surgery is very much part of insurance coverage. 
and the surgery is advised if patient has a BMI more than 40 or more than 35 with these four medical issues. These uh, BMI criteria is more of the American and WHO criteria, although as Asim rightly said, in Indians, we offer bariatric surgery at a lower uh, indication. But with this kind of BMI, coverage does take place. And as I had mentioned, we get patients at our hospital at much higher BMI. So most of our patients who have insurance more than four years are able to get the insurance coverage, both for bariatric surgery and for robotic surgery. So this is some an excellent question you asked because many people, including many doctors, are not aware about the fact that uh, bariatric surgery is being covered under insurance. It's also covered under CGHS and many companies too. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Arun. Suppose we are, uh, uh, you know, by, by uh, shared decision, we are uh, choosing it to uh, choosing uh, to do bariatric surgery in a person of uh, BMI, say uh, somewhere between 29 and 30 and without comorbidity and a uh, person is on, uh, say, treatment, something like antidepressant and likely to be on that for, for a very, very long time and not really able to lose weight. So if we are doing in that kind of patient where there is there is uh, no other comorbidity, that in that case, it won't be covered. No, it won't be. The insurance will not cover because they are right now at that stage. But our Obesity Surgery Society of India is in negotiation with the authorities as well as insurance companies to widen the coverage. A patient of 29 to 30, we would probably not offer bariatric surgery also. We'll uh, look at lifestyle modifications, diet, and maybe at best offer them some endoscopic procedures. Okay. Right. This is, this is I mean, uh, we're talking when patient has exhausted all the all the resources, diet, exercise, and, and on antidepressant. So as you, as you write, uh, mentioned yes i mean the uh, other procedure not not exactly uh, the bypass surgery but other procedures can be can be done in such a patient so dr asim can i ask you the same question what are the common uh, commonly done procedures at your place and are they covered by insurance at your place so uh, <clears throat> first of all um, in singapore the insurance system is slightly different we have a government insurance and uh, we then have a private insurance Unfortunately, the private insurance does not cover metabolic bariatric surgery. I mean, we have to appeal case by case. Uh, mostly the diabetics, obese diabetics will get their surgery done. Uh, but without uh, any, uh, with other comorbidities and uh, weight loss surgery alone, uh, the private insurance does not cover. The government insurance 100% uh, covers bariatric surgery, metabolic surgery, uh, in its own in Singapore. Uh, among the common procedures that are in Singapore, we still do a large proportion of sleeve gastric meats, followed by the Ruin Wire gastric bypass, followed by OAGB. And in reversal and regional procedures, we do SADIS and BPDS. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Asant. I can see there is one more question in the chat box. Any indication for correction of diabetes without obesity. So this is actually, you know, Dr. Sushil Jain, you're actually talking about metabolic surgery. And uh, I, uh, this, uh, I mean, as, as you, Dr. Asim was showing in that ADA slide, that there is a suggestion, you know, beyond 27.5, if, if, if the patient has diabetes, this, this can be considered. So what do you say, Dr. Asim, about this question? Okay, so Sushil's question is a great question, and many people ask the same question as well. Uh, and he says without obesity, and I will take without obesity as 27.5 uh, and below. Uh, but Sushil, uh, the new uh, ADA guidelines say 25. A uh, long time back when I did my fellowship in Taiwan, uh, I looked at the data because at that time, my uh, mentor was doing uh, BMIs 25 and below. Um, it does help. Uh, don't get me wrong. It does, it does uh, help but the risk outweigh the benefits. They tend to develop more marginal ulcers, complications, at least at that point in time. Uh, and uh, at that time, uh, when I trained with Dr. Huang, he had already done a thousand over cases of uh, obese BMIs. And I think I looked at about 100 something odd patients below 25 BMI and we published it in SORT. And the complications were far more significant 
than the obese cohort. So the risk did not balance. And that is why no guidelines uh, will recommend uh, patients to go to surgery be below 27.5. Uh, under special circumstances, like poorly controlled diabetes, between 25 to 27.5, you can make a case. But again, I would say that case should come in a study cohort or should be well debated at the MDT before it goes into action. It should not be the norm. It should be an exclusion. That's how I put it. Sure. I would like to add there that uh, endoscopic balloon is an option because it's uh, something that is uh, temporary. Even if it leads to about 5 to 10% of weight loss, Dr. Richa would agree that just 5 to 10% weight loss can significantly bring down the HbA1c in patients who've got good reserves. So we usually check their uh, C-peptide levels and activated C-peptide levels, patients who are male, diabetes less than five years. So we have various criteria where we can actually know how successful the weight loss procedure would be. And I fully agree with Asim that uh, lower BMI patients with diabetes currently only on trials, these procedures are being done. Uh, I specifically brought out this question because of a lot of false WhatsApp messages rolling around uh, uh, the country uh, having this as a definitive procedure for uh, correction of diabetes. So that's why I wanted to, uh, this to be clarified by the expert. That so was specific cases, happened. yes, especially the obese diabetics. But uh, for... Uh, Non-obese diabetes, one has to be extremely careful. Yeah. So, Dr. Asim, I have a question. What is the scenario with uh, weight loss drugs with uh, pharmacotherapy uh, at your place? Are uh, anti-obesity drugs being used very commonly? Uh, all the classes that are approved by FDA or there are some, like in, in India, uh, there are there are some, some ones which are not available, like fentermine is not really available. Although we, have, we get, can get the combination of fentermine uh, and topiramate online. So at your place, are you using all the recommended drugs before really going for surgery? Uh, so Dr. Richa, um, on us is a little different. So we have all this that we have fentermine. Uh, we don't have combination drugs uh, at the moment. Uh, we have liraglutide, we have Saxenda available, and we use them not only for uh, weight loss uh, before surgery or as a bridge to surgery, but as a definitive intervention. And sometimes even... Uh, post-operatively to augment weight loss and for, for treating weight regain. So we are quite liberal in using these drugs and pharmacotherapy is increasingly becoming not only uh, our momentum for our endocrinologists and physicians, but surgeons are now also using these drugs uh, to help augment whatever they have achieved uh, through uh, surgical therapy. And to add to what Arun just said, uh, also, if, if you want to enhance the outcomes of endoscopic therapy, intragastric balloon for those who are lower BMI, uh, or even sleeve gastroplasty endoscopic, you can use semaglutide with it once weekly, and it works magics. Right. Semaglutide, injectable semaglutide is, as of now is not available at our place. Uh, but yes, as you rightly said, uh, guidelines all our textbook endocrinology textbook says says that before the weight has reached nadir even before that we should start uh, using weight loss uh, medications to really uh, you know maintain that kind of weight loss that is going to be finally achieved with with, with the surgery so uh, i think there is one more question that has come up uh, contraindications for not using pharmacotherapy post bariatric like semaglutide or liraglutide so dr arun would you like to comment on this for not using pharmacotherapy post bariatric. Uh, yeah, please. Although this is more a, a endocrine question, but please go ahead. Sure, sure. See, actually, I will ask you to answer that question. Before that, I'll just like to say that we are using this for patients who are having weight regain after bariatric surgery or inadequate weight loss. Because sometimes there is a, you know, in the curve, there is a glip and the weight loss st stops. And there, this acts as a booster. We used to use Victoza earlier. Now we are using Rebelsis, the semaglutide. And both seem to have good effect, though temporary, for weight uh, regain and inadequate weight loss. But I'll hand over to you to answer the, about the contraindications. Uh, 
So actually, there, uh, there are no contraindications, but uh, practically we see there are some patients who are uh, who, who continue to have GI symptoms uh, for a long time after the surgery, like you know some kind of vomiting and abdominal issues they persist. I think it's only in that set of patients that that uh, we cannot use that for uh, obvious uh, uh, GI issues. But otherwise, there is uh, I don't see any other contraindication for. It. You know, apart from the usual ones, there is no, there should be no family history of uh, medullary thyroid carcinoma. There is no sort of uh, risk for pancreatitis. Uh, apart from that, I don't see any other contra contraindication if the patient's uh, GI system seems to be all right. Uh, so there is, I think, one more one more comment which has come: SGLT2 inhibitors role in weight loss. Uh, so SGLT2 inhibitors, they are. Uh, uh, very good class of medications which impart benefit in cardiovascular uh, adverse outcomes also and they are they have been found to be good in chronic kidney uh, disease uh, progression halting that progression and of, and uh, they of course produce a weight loss also we use them in our uh, we like to use them in our patients uh, of type 2 diabetes with obesity and weight loss is to the tune of uh, 4 to 5 kg for around 4 to 5% uh, in general with SGLT2 inhibitors so yes uh, as far as uh, weight loss therapy is concerned in our type 2 diabetes uh, patients GLP1 receptor analogs and SGLT2 inhibitors these are two classes of medication we, we are using very, very commonly. And now that we, the cost barrier also is not there these days, we are using very commonly and they are a good adjunct, but uh, they, they work. I mean, but they uh, the weight loss achieved with weight loss medications may not be, generally it is not that much, obviously that as achieved by weight loss surgery. So in uh, moderately obese, they might work, but in severely obese, bariatric surgery is the option. And, and uh, you know, many a times we have to really work hard to convince the patient that... Uh, bariatric surgery is the option. Another thing I want to ask both the surgeons, do you have a team like uh, uh, mental health specialists, which, which they say they should be there? So do you, uh, those, uh, you know, mental health uh, specialists uh, work with you in your team routinely? Or it's only in select patients, those are referred to uh, psychologists? Achim, would you like to answer first? Okay. So um, even the biggest centers in the world, if you go who have the oldest establishment, uh, they do not have regular psychologists or psychiatrists working with them and assessing each and every individual patient because it's very labor intensive, long interviews lasting uh, an hour plus for each and it's not possible in the same clinical setting to do this. So how we do it in my center is the patients are given questionnaires. We use the PHQ-9 questionnaire to screen for depression and anxiety in these patients. If they go beyond a certain threshold of scoring, uh, we will pick those up and we will refer them to our psychiatry colleagues for, uh, for assessment. Uh, we have an eating behavior analysis scoring system as well. And if we find out that they have uh, binge eating disorders, night grazing disorders, and other eating disorders, we would then appropriately refer them to psychologists for counseling. Uh, but uh, they all get screened through questionnaires and then get referred out if they do score certain uh, points. Uh, otherwise, no, uh, we don't uh, regularly send everybody to psychologists. Uh, and then at six months follow up, they repeat the same questionnaires uh, and we assess their suicidal tendencies and across uh, yearly follow up, we do that. Thank you. Yes, so we also do screening. Usually our nutrition team, our nutritionist or the surgeon or the physician, they uh, go through the basic questions and assessment of the patient. And only if we need uh, a psychiatric evaluation, then we refer the patient to psychiatrist. Because most of these people are also quite reluctant to meet a psychiatrist as bariatric patients. We call them patients, but they're actually not patients because they uh, don't, nobody thinks that they're suffering from a disease for which they need to consult a psychiatrist. So most of the counseling is done by the surgeon, the nutritionist and the physician. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arun. So uh, now I invite Dr. Sushil Jain, honorary advisor to GAPIO for the vote of thanks. So uh, thank you both the speakers and Dr. Richa for conducting this session and uh, more uh, were the, the interesting discussion which uh, followed the two, uh, two talks. And I also take this opportunity to, to thank the GAPU team and the technical team behind this uh, whole show. Thank you very much. We look forward for such, more such sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Asim.
Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Happy holidays ahead.